All right. Um, we still have, we still see people coming in for today. Um, thank you all for, for joining. Um, we had a, we had a great feedback to our invite and I think, uh, about, uh, 100, 670 people, um, wanted to join today, wanted to join this afternoon. And it's not that easy for us uh, to reach out to all of you because you're spread around the world and we have, uh, visitors from from all over um, but let me come to that in a in a minute first of all hello and welcome to the whitestate.net uh, 3.5 release event um, it's a release that we've been working for and working hard for to release um, in during the last months and we are very happy and proud to share this with you today doing a deep dive into the new options and features that are there uh, showing a bit of what we release um, from our um, from our garage, uh, so to say, um, ready to help you build, migrate, and modernize your solutions. Um, before we start off, a uh, quick introduction. Who am I? Uh, my name is Thomas, Thomas Altama. I'm one of the co-founders of IC Group, uh, the company behind YSJ.net. Uh, today, um, I'm responsible for sales and marketing, so some of you may um, have worked or exchanged some emails with me already. Um, in case of any questions, feedback, and so on, uh, just drop me a line. And together with my team, uh, we'll be happy to pick up. Um, you'll find my, my email address here. I'm also going to share my details later on towards the end of this um, event today. Yeah, but um, let's uh, let's look into what we what we have planned today. And before we do that, I um, wanted to send a warm welcome um, out to all of you. And um, since we had so many registrations, I thought it would be interesting to see where are you from. And um, it's not that easy. Um, all of you register with, with an email address um, and the domain ending, the .com and .de and .at cannot be directly located and um, targeted to, uh, towards the country. But we did some analysis and we found out that we have participants today from really all over the world. 25, more than 25 countries um, are present today across all time zones. So I would like to send a warm welcome and good morning to the West Coast in the US. Uh, we have people joining us from California um, to the East Coast, uh, to the Eastern Standard Time, and also the, the time zones throughout um, the, uh, the, the, the United States of America. Um, good morning to you as well. Um, Washington, D.C. is um, our head office um, in uh, beautiful Georgetown. So a nice uh, warm welcome and hi to my friends and colleagues that connect from there. I would like to say hello also to the people joining from South America. We have people from Chile today, from um, Brazil. Um, and then we come to Europe. I'm located in Germany. Um, so for me, it's just a bit um, beyond 4 p.m., uh, 16 o'clock in the afternoon. But we also have people joining from France, from Spain, from the United Kingdom, um, from the Nordics with Sweden, Norway, and so on. Uh, Turkey, um, a nice uh, warm welcome to you as well. Uh, South Africa, and um, good night almost uh, to Japan and even uh, the East Coast in Australia, because I spotted a couple of people that registered from there. Uh, very happy to have you with us today. And uh, thank you for staying up so long to listen to this event. Uh, we feel very honored about this. Um, yeah, it's not just about the 3.5 release. Um, it's also a very special year for us. Uh, this year, um, IC Group, the company um, that invented, um, that developed YSJ.net, uh, turned 25 this year. Um, so we are um, we are really grown-ups now, um, I could say. And um, the company was founded in 1998. And um, I just wanted to share this with you. We had a nice event uh, this year and uh, all partners uh, and um, um, all um, and some friends met uh, together in Europe uh, during an event, um, and they digged out uh, some old pictures uh, to show that, uh, yeah, um, when we looked back, um, we couldn't really find something from 1998. Um, uh, they may may be on paper somewhere because back at the times, digital cameras were not really around. But the first picture, the first digital picture that I found was from an event in 2000. Um, I think it was taken in. In Germany, if I remember correctly, and uh, as you see, we had a beautiful logo back then. Um, we already had um, 
some of the colors that we're still using today. Um, Carsten, um, our partner from Denmark, brought some snow beer along to this event. Uh, we had a lot of fun and uh, I even found a picture showing uh, some of us many, many years ago. Um, almost nothing has changed except for the gray here. Uh, gray hair, um, but uh, no, I'm, re I'm really happy to to be around with this company, with this group, and uh, so thanks once again for for also you joining us today, and because we really enjoy working with you, uh, with our customers, and uh, working on YC.net, which is a technology that we're really entirely 120% focused on these days. But um, that's history. Um, we are here today in 2023. Um, it will be a new year in, in just a few weeks' time. And um, we want to look into the release into YC.net 3.5 uh, today with you. Um, so I asked some of my colleagues for help um, and I would like to hand over in, in just a couple of minutes to Gianluca Pivato, um, the, the head, uh, the inventor behind YC.net, our CTO. He will um, give a, an overview of the 3.5 release, um, showing some features, doing a little deep dive of uh, what's in it and what you can expect from the new version. Um, and right after Luca, um, we'll have Levi, um, our um, yeah, youngest partner and uh, the director, the, the head behind uh, the mobile development activities uh, for a few years already, um, showing a new baby, uh, which is called YShaderNet Hybrid. It's a technology based on Maui.net, which enables YShaderNet applications to not just be around in the browser, in the web um, hosted, um, on, on a web server or being deployed through a cloud service. But uh, we now also have an option um, to bring YJ applications to a native app, meaning that YJ cannot only run on iOS or Android. Um, it can also run as an application, as an app on macOS, on Windows, as a Windows app. And this will even work offline, which is really something new. Um, and we are very excited about this step, about having reach this level of progress um, along with the 3.5 release. We have also invited um, two guests today, um, and we are very happy to have Amit uh, with us, um, a long year customer from a company called Amtech. They're based in uh, Philadelphia um, in, 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 the, in the US. And uh, Amit will share a little bit uh, from his daily work and uh, some of the uh, projects and the applications that he's working on. Uh, especially a planning board application, which was completed this year, uh, a really interesting pr um, project, very fascinating what um, Amit and his team did um, based on YC.net. And um, he agreed to to give a little overview and uh, a little insight of how he is using YC as a technology. So very happy. Um, thank you, Amit, for being with us today. And we also asked Dino, Dino Esposito, um, a good friend of us um, and a long year author, MVP, um, uh, one of um, a, a pretty well-known speaker. He has been to many, many events in the last 25 years. Um, Dino is really on web applications, web enterprise applications. You may have some books from him in, in your bookshelf. And um, Dino has been uh, working with Weichler.net um, and uh, we've, we are changing ideas and, and um, yeah approaches uh, here and then. And I'm ha very happy to have Dino with us today. He's going to share a small keynote, um, about half an hour, um, sharing his view and his insight on web application developments, especially when focused on enterprise applications. Uh, the entire event is scheduled for a bit more than two hours, two, two and a half hours. So um, uh, depending on your time zone, um, I think in about two hours, we should be finished with it. And um, yeah, before I uh, now continue forever, um, I better, uh, move on and um, hand over to Luca, to my colleague Luca, and uh, we are very interesting to hear Luca um, some of the uh, things that were now implemented with 3.5 with the features uh, that that um, you and your team added to the new release. Okay, hey Thomas, thank you. Um, I think there is a hand raised from Gunter. Oh yes. I don't know if yeah. it was if it clicked on somewhere. Yeah, it, it may have just been a wave or um, a hand. I don't know, um, but but that's a good thing um, to to actually mention here. If you have something to to add, uh, just a comment or some feedback, 
feel free to use the chat. Um, we enabled the chat um, window and also the question and answer module in Zoom. Um, the webinar is recorded. Um, so what's written in the chat um, may be used against you. <laughs> no, seriously. Uh, any questions are welcome. And we are happy to hear um, also your feedback and your questions. We'll try to collect the questions. So Luca and Levi uh, will do their um, session. And I will um, monitor the chat and will try to um, bring back some of the questions that you may have raised uh, through the sessions to them. So we have some time um, planned in um, for questions and answers. And everything that else that we cannot cover today will be um, taken with us and we will get back to you by email. <clears throat> so Luca, the stage is yours. Um, and um, yeah, we, we look forward to, to hearing the news around YJ 3.5. Okay, great. Um, is my screen sharing correctly, Thomas? Yes, yes, yes. Okay, um, great. So what's new in 3.5? Um, as Thomas mentioned, the most significant announcement that we had in 3.5 um, is uh, the support uh, of hybrid hybrid applications on different on different target, uh, targets. Uh, so now we support iOS, Android, Windows apps, and Mac OS, and WSJ is able to run on all sorts of devices, uh, which includes embed the systems. This was the heaviest uh, part of this update. Um, we have also added a number of announcements um, to um, all the WSJ components on both the .NET side, uh, server side, and the JavaScript um, side. Uh, it introduced a number of uh, uh, new extensions, uh, both free and premium um, extensions. In general, um, I like to take this opportunity to mention that everything that we add, uh, everything we change, and sometimes we break uh, in WSJ is always driven uh, by our experience on uh, on projects daily. Uh, the projects are yours. We get feedback uh, from developers all over the world, uh, and we sometimes get frustrated with our own product and we fix it or enhance it um, as uh, as it's needed. And uh, we usually have the same problems that you have. And we try to um, um, improve the product, always keeping an eye on business applications and uh, everyday everyday work. So let's go over the list uh, of what we added and what we changed. Um, all right, so looking at the list, um, on top of the list, we have hybrid and offline. These are two different things, obviously, but they are closely related. The, the offline feature is, a, is a possible only because of the hybrid implementation. But uh, going hybrid doesn't mean that you have to go offline. Um, hybrid is basically the replacement of our previous um, hosted service, standalone application, and uh, WiseJam mobile stack. Basically, there, there were three different products, and now they've been consolidated into a single uh, system, which we call WiseJet.net uh, hybrid. So all the three are basically gone. They're still available uh, on GitHub, uh, and but we're not maintaining them um, anymore. We're only working on the WiseJ hybrid when it comes to um, device native deployment um, and uh, yeah, offline. We are also in the, pro in the process of adding a lot more support for MVVM, so for uh, the uh, view model support. We started that with 3.2. We're still adding features in this uh, in this release. We simply added the support for iData I error info interface to the validation extender. Um, and that allows the uh, new validation extender that was added in 3.2 to also bind to data sources and receive error information from the view model or the model itself. Um, then we... Um, extended or uh, enhanced the data grid view extensibility by exposing some internal methods as public overridable methods. Uh, for example, this was also required in a project where we had to replace um, infragistics classes and rebuild the entire um, data grid view object model. And uh, we could do it thanks to these um, methods that have been exposed. Uh, the same is true for the error provider. It's a, it's a good old um, extender uh, that we have um, uh, also enhanced to provide virtual methods and events, enable to show multiple ex uh, error providers on the same form, and uh, which I'm, I'm going to show all of these on in Visual Studio actually shortly. Uh, auto tooltip. This one is an AI generating your tooltips in your application as it runs. Uh, no, I'm joking. It's simply it's simply um, a way to show a native tooltip uh, when the label is truncated. This is also um, seemingly a minor feature, but it's ex 
extremely useful in the complex applications where you may have labels, buttons, checkboxes with text that gets truncated. Either you get the dot, 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 uh, but you can't really read the full text. So this uh, auto tooltip, new auto tooltip property will show the native tooltip with the uh, remaining, uh, with the full text. <laughs> List view item visibility, that's a new property that we also found on projects where we've seen developers removing items, re-adding items, keeping a parallel list. So now we added the, visib the visible property to items so you can show and add them. Um, there is also a second track in, in YSJ that we are uh, working on uh, for, for these versions and future, future releases, which is um, enhancing the API or the uh, coding pattern. So we, we added now new constructors to so basically all the um, visual controls uh, and method chaining uh, to allow more modern um, coding patterns when you build the controls dynamically in code. Um, we also designed a new Bootstrap dark, uh, dark team uh, that um, that simply that goes together with uh, the um, uh, application the browser that is dark mode property and allows your app to detect to actually go dark when the system is also in dark mode. And we've seen this trend in several apps. Uh, basically, no one is uh, very few companies, very few uh, applications are now building multiple teams that simply going light or dark. So we provided this uh, uh, dark bootstrap team as a base. In terms of extensions. We have a, a, um, a chat um, ex control, extremely flexible. Levi is going to give a demonstration of that because he built it. Uh, and we have a signature control, pull to refresh, mobile scroll, uh, integration, tester JS, and then Dynam soft. Uh, going into a little bit more details on this, uh, let's see the next one. OK, um, so going back to the hybrid, which was we said at the beginning is a major announcement. Um, the hybrid system is built on MAUI. <clears throat> we do not use the MAUI controls other than the web view, but we use the MAUI native layer. Um, so now we do not have the Swift uh, code base and the Android Studio code base. We only have one single C-sharp code base uh, that can host <clears throat> YSJ application natively on basically anything. Um, this basically will expose the, the typical device object to the YSJ application that can interact <clears throat> with, with the device. Um, for those of you that don't know what, what, what these uh, three products that have been replaced are, uh, one is the hosted service, which was able to run a YSJ.net as an, an executable. The other was a WinForms uh, window with an embedded browser that could run YSJ as a, as a window. And the other was the YSJ mobile um, um, set of um, projects, uh, one built in uh, Swift and one built in Android Studio. Um, anyway, they're all being uh, consolidated into one single uh, <clears throat> product. To give you like a quick background on this, um, the, the .NET Core runtime that targets Android and iOS device is very different <clears throat> than the standard .NET Core runtime that you can run on Linux or Windows. Um, in fact, it's not true that it's been unified. <clears throat> Only the base classes was unified as of .NET 8. Um, so we have to have a different target for YSJ framework, and now we're targeting uh, iOS, Android, and Windows, and, and uh, Windows apps, sorry, which is different than Mac OS. Um, in, in order to do this, we have to support uh, a different server. Uh, instead of using the SPNet Core OWIN middleware, we use Ca uh, using Kestrel. Now we're using Embed.io, which is a fully managed open source lightweight uh, web server that can run basically uh, any, anywhere, even in a vending machine. So that's our third uh, target. Another problem is the um, lib, um, the system drawing common library, which Microsoft deprecated from known Windows systems um, because it was based on libgdi plus on Linux, which is also another old and supported uh, uh, library. So we um, licensed, we got a um, perpetual um, image sharp OEM license and we built our own um, version of the system drawing common. We call him system drawing managed, uh, which is entirely written in C sharp, one single uh, assembly, and we just published it on NuGet as a free um, free beta. It's a, it's an ongoing process, it's ongoing, and we will keep uh, adding uh, features all based on image on image uh, sharp. So this way, we have a fully managed system drawing uh, object model that we can use on any any device. Um, the same goes for Embed.io. We have integrated it into the YSJ um, 
middleware system uh, they call it module actually and uh, so we very soon will actually right now we are able to run even in a, in a refrigerator or any other device um, let's see the next one okay so validation extender i mentioned that we support the data binding at a data error info uh, info for uh, mvc and mvbm models error provider announcement uh, i'm going to show that uh, running i don't have much time actually left so i'm going to run it right away the auto tool tip New constructors, uh, we, uh, for now, we added the new constructor with size, location, default event handler, select like a click uh, or a selected index change and labels. Method chaining is basic methods that now return the object itself. So you can call, you know, dot uh, show, dot uh, set something and dot, 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 and have um, a single line instead of keep calling the same object over and over. Let's see. This was This is what the bootstrap thing looks like. These are the extensions. You're going to see a live demo of this one. Uh, the, the, the chat control uh, can also connect it to a server, so you can actually build chat features into your applications uh, uh, now. The pull to refresh allows to do this pulling and refresh in typical mobile devices. Uh, uh, it's available. Um, oh, the image is reverted anyway. It's available to um, the um, uh, WildJ hybrid uh, systems. Uh, Tesseract JS and Dynamsoft are all related to um, scanning. Okay, so let's see. Visual Studio. Now, uh, I got it. What is it? There we go. So I, I built a very simple app <clears throat> to show you some of these features. And uh, I took also the opportunity to show some common uh, YJ programming uh, um, patterns. So in this case, for example, I built a navigation page uh, with some inherited controls, previous, title, and next in order to navigate through three pages. This, is, this has been available since ever, but uh, this feature will show you how to use it. Program, I simply create page one, two, three, next page, next page, previous page. So when we run this, I don't see the button. How do I hide this? Okay, let's do it like that. There it is. It's not right. Is it right? Oh, here it is. Okay. Um, I got the zoom toolbar. Anyway. So these are the three pages. Next, next, previous. Remember the... Um, error provider, so this error provider here, it's connected to the view model. So whatever I write here, it will give me an error. Sorry, this is page one, so repeat page two. Uh, now I got my error. Uh, this are, it says that it's required. In this case, for example, required, but you'll see the icon that changes. If I say, if I put something else, it will say that it cannot be a future date. So I have two different error providers here, and I will, this is one of the extensions that uh, um, that was added to the error provider. Um, this is part of the validation extender. So now you, you can have the same validation through the view model into custom labels, and you can show your errors however um, however you like. Now, in terms of the tooltip, um, you see this checkboxes is also data bound to the view model. Uh, let's say let's say if I put something really long here, the this is a long name. This is a long description. Now, the text of this chat, uh, this chat box is bound to these two. See, I got the auto ellipsis, and now I got my uh, auto tooltip. So, whenever the text overflows, um, we get the auto tooltip uh, for uh, chat boxes, labels, buttons, and radio buttons. They, and it's also updated automatically through the data binding. If we look at the code of this, um, it's page one. You'll see that I have two error providers, my required error provider and my error provider, and they are not connected to each control. So they're simply using um, the data source, the same data source and the same data source. And then the my error provider, it's, what is it? My cool my error provider, this one. 
Now we can override <coughs> the set error methods. We, uh, I added a new property. So in this case, this error provider will only show the required errors and the other error provider will show the other errors. This way on my form, I can have both. One with this icon and the other one uh, with the standard icons. And they'll work together. So they, the error provider itself will decide when to show its own error or not. Uh, and it doesn't have to be done uh, programmatically because my errors are all checked in here through the ADATA error info. Uh, this is all standard, but uh, the, um, uh, this has always been supported, but the possibility of deciding what to show and not to show is what has been added in 3.5. In three um, and the same goes for the validation extender, which is all shown here. I have the new validation extender. In this case, um, I add the validation rules for each control uh, and it's connected to the label. Um, this one is also getting data. Actually, sorry, it's the other one, page three. This is the validation extender, is getting the errors from the data source and is using as an error provider in this case, is using a custom error provider, which is this one. And this one instead simply shows an alert box. So just by dropping these controls into the form, I can achieve something like this really easily. And it's all coming from the view model or the model. So I don't have to write the code for everything. So let's say I'm here, there goes my error, or I'm here. See, this is, this one shows me, shows the alert box. And this is all done through binding, through the validation extender, um, and through this new um, uh, Virtual, virtual methods. One last uh, thing about the um, data grid view, um, the extensions you will see in this code that I have overridden create summary row. All I'm doing is adding a default style uh, as a static object to save memory to the summary rows. And when I use that, I'll go here and there you go. So these are my summary rows uh, that are um, created from this override. And I can simply decide what I want to create. I could even create my own class here and I can override everything I want. This is one of the extensions, uh, sorry, one of the methods that has been exposed and allows um, customization of the data grid view. Uh, in terms of hiding and showing, you can see here, for example, uh, previously uh, we find code where these items have to be removed and re-added and now I can simply add them, show them and add them and I can simply say, pick whatever I want here. So that's all, that's all working. Uh, so I can uh, hide items. I can bind to, to error providers. Uh, I can have auto tool tips. Um, and um, I can simply write shorter code, which actually one example is here. This adds a button with a new constructor. So now I can simply do new button, click me, location, size, and I can put my own um, uh, my own um, handler simply in one one line and one call. An example of that, it's here. Thomas, I am I on time? Perfect, Luca. Okay. Excellent. There we go. So this is my button. So, and you can find these constructors everywhere. I could do these controls. Add new text box, and you will find five cost constructors here. You can add your, your actions for the text change, the label of the buttons, and then still the actions, a lot of these um, are optional parameters. So you're able to basically write more concise code uh, when creating dynamic uh, UI uh, interfaces. And the same goes for chaining. Um, for example, uh, I could do this uh, text box one dot show dot, and I can still write in code um, I don't know what else can I write here. Set, uh, uh, send to back, dot, and keep going. So you can have dot, 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 and this all added to all the uh, four methods. We're going to keep adding this constructor. We're going to keep adding this chain, uh, modifying some methods to allow them to return themselves and have chain, uh, chain uh, calls. Um, other than that, I don't think I have much more to show. Let's see. Nope. I'm pretty much uh, done, Thomas. All right. Uh, thanks, Luca. Thank you. Thank you very much.
um, and uh, for yeah sharing um, some of the news that are in the in the new release um, as we speak. Um, the documentation has been updated, so there's a what's new page uh, for 3.5 in our documentation site called docs.yj.com. And um, you can yeah look at all the new features and uh, do a little um, yeah I mean you would just suggest to try them out play around with them. But before you do that, um, I would like to head over to uh, Levi, um, who is um, who has been very very busy and uh, engaged with uh, um, the YSH hybrid release, um, a technology that's really new um, for us. We've been um, developing this for quite some time. It has some uh, predecessors with device development mobile, which some of you have been using for Android and iOS devices. Device mobile applications were always connected, meaning that they were able to interface with the local device hardware, but they always needed a connection to um, a remote server, a device development server. And I think um, the two most prominent features in YSHA Hybrid are, for for the one hand, it's really something that is cross applications, cross platform, meaning it's not only iOS and Android, we also support um, other platforms such as Windows and Mac OS as um, target deployment operating systems. And uh, for YSHA Hybrid, we still have the connected mode, we have a hybrid <laughs> um, uh, scenario, but we also support offline applications. And I think that's really interesting. Um, I remember many nights of discussing and talking and you know brainstorming with my colleagues and uh, thinking about, well, what would be a next possible good step and reaching offline capable applications by just focusing on .NET coding, what was for a very long time difficult to impossible to achieve. Um, but now we found a way and um, I'm very happy to have Levi with us today for, for doing um, a, a short introduction and presentation of why the hybrid. He will share a few slides, uh, but he will also do a little deep dive um, into a live presentation. Um, that's what he usually does. Uh, let's be surprised. And uh, Levi, the stage is yours. Um, please take over and uh, take, us, um, take us with you um, into the new world of hybrid. Okay, uh, let me share my screen here. Is that working? Yes, it's working. Thank you. Can you guys hear me all right, too? I know there were some audio issues earlier. No, just perfect. Uh, you're fine. OK, perfect. Um, well, thank you all for coming today. Uh, so I'm Levi Rivenau. I'm one of the software developers that works on YJ and YJ Hybrid. Um, and today, we're going to do a kind of little introduction on what YJ Hybrid is um, and kind of compare that to traditional app development. So I'm going to continue here. Uh, yeah, so we'll take a quick look at traditional app development, and then that kind of leads us into what is YJ Hybrid. Um, and then we'll dive into Visual Studio, actually build an application. Um, and then I'll briefly talk about the deployment of YJ Hybrid applications. So traditional app development. Uh, so this IDE might be familiar to some of you. Uh, so this is Xcode. Uh, Xcode is a Mac-only IDE, um, which allows you to build applications for iOS, Mac OS, Watch OS, uh, whatever, iPad OS, whatever they come out with, right? Um, and Xcode is a very powerful tool. Um, there's a couple different ways to build user interfaces in Xcode. Uh, so one way is using the storyboard, which is what you see in the screenshot. So I can drag and drop controls from my kind of toolbox onto the storyboard. Um, the other way is using Swift UI. So that's a more declarative approach to building user interfaces. Um, both are great, both are very powerful, um, but there's a few caveats of using Xcode. Um, one, if you don't have a Mac, um, you're not really gonna be able to build applications for iOS. Um, the other issue, uh, I'm sure a lot of you, if not all of you, are .NET developers and .NET shops. Um, and so a lot of your business logic, a lot of your development experience revolves around C Sharp and .NET. Um, so there's kind of a learning curve uh, when you would be going to an IDE like this. Um, the other issue is that you're only building applications for iOS and macOS. 
Um, if you want to build an Android application, that would be a uh, separate project with a separate code base. Uh, and then we have Android Studio. So this uh, kind of runs into the same issues, um, but Android Studio is an IDE for building Android applications on Windows and Mac. Uh, typically, development is done using Java or Kotlin, um, and you build user interfaces in Android Studio using an XML-based designer. Um, overall, a very powerful tool. Um, you can build very complex applications with this. Um, but we run into the same issues. If I want to build an iOS application, then I have to do that uh, as part of a separate project in Codebase. Uh, I can't use my C-sharp existing uh, business logic or VB existing business logic inside of this application. Um, and I must know Java or Kotlin. So then enter .NET MAUI. So .NET MAUI is Microsoft's solution for cross-platform application development. It unifies Xamarin, um, which is Android and iOS development based on Mono, um, and it unifies the kind of desktop development experience for Windows and Mac. Um, and so this is a big step forward. Um, with .NET MAUI, everything is done in Visual Studio using C Sharp and the XAML-based designer. Um, with that XAML-based designer, there are a few limitations, right? Um, so one of these is the control set. Uh, so with .NET MAUI, if you're using uh, simple controls, you shouldn't run into any issues. So if you're using an image, a label, a button, a text field, uh, MAUI is great for that. Or if you need a simple kind of layout, it's great. Um, you can also reuse your existing C Sharp business logic, which is awesome. Um, if you don't love XAML, you're probably not going to love .NET MAUI. Uh, but overall, it's a big step forward. So uh, kind of uh, tying all these different things together, there's a lot of different considerations. Uh, do you want an interactive designer? So do you like that uh, kind of drag and drop experience from the toolbox onto the designer? Or do you uh, like building those XML-based layouts um, or XAML-based layouts? Um, do you need a common theme across your application? So if we're building apps for Android and iOS, and we're using Android Studio and Xcode, uh, each one's going to have that native iOS or Android theme. Uh, what kind of controls are you going to be using in your application? So do you just need those simple controls like the uh, button, the text box, the label, or are you going to be showing more complex control sets, um, uh, maybe like a data grid or some other way to visualize your data, uh, which might require a third party uh, vendor component? Um, do you have the required hardware to run that IDE? So if you're uh, developing an iOS application, do you have a Mac uh, to run Xcode? Um, and then developer experience. So do the developers that are working at your company have experience building you know, Android Studio Java applications or Kotlin applications or Swift or Objective-C with Xcode? Or since you're a .NET shop, I'm sure most of you are familiar with .NET, C Sharp, or VB. So uh, that kind of leads us into what is YJ Hybrid. Uh, so YJ Hybrid is our solution for developing applications for Windows, Mac OS, and mobile, so Android and iOS. Uh, the benefit of using YJ Hybrid compared to uh, .NET MAUI or one of the other platforms, um, it kind of ties everything together. So we get a visual designer similar to that Xcode storyboard port approach where we can drag and drop controls from the Visual Studio toolbox onto our YJ designer, um, which is what I did in the screenshot on the right hand side here. Um, and when I run this application, uh, it looks the exact same as it does in the designer, as it does on the iOS emulator when I'm running it offline. Um, the other benefit is that you have a, now have a shared code base for your web application, which is your ASP.NET or ASP.NET Core application. Um, and you can reuse that code base, including the UI, for your mobile application and your desktop application. So one suite for, or one code base for every single type of application, web, mobile, and desktop. Um, and YJ Hybrid is specifically tar targeted towards line of business-based applications. So if you're building a very simple um, data intake application, a few fields, um, a submit button, uh, this might not be the best choice for you, um, but if you're looking to build something that is complex and you don't like working with 
XAML or XML, and you want to use that wide designer that you're familiar with, um, then this is the way to go. So just comparing the architectures briefly, um, I'm sure most of you know kind of the YJ architecture. So I access the application using Chrome, Edge, or Safari, or Firefox, uh, and it loads a URL, which ends up being my YJ application, the ASP.NET or ASP.NET Core app. Um, behind that, I have my business logic, my data access layer, those kinds of things, and that communicates with my database. Um, with hybrid, it's a little bit different. So instead of uh, Chrome, Edge, or Safari here, I have this hybrid client section. And so the hybrid client is an executable that you build in Visual Studio for Windows, Mac OS, Android, or iOS. So it represents that IPA file for iOS, the APK or the AAB Android application bundle for Android, or the executable for Windows. Um, but other than that, the general approach is the same. So um, inside of this hybrid client, I have an embedded web view, which loads a URL, which loads my YJ application. Um, but this comes in two flavors with YJ hybrid. So there's the remote mode, which is what most of you are familiar with. So this is where you build your application in Visual Studio. Um, and then you deploy that application to Azure, to AWS, uh, on-premise, wherever it is you deploy it. Um, but when you're configuring your hybrid client in this remote mode, you're going to enter the URL of that external application inside of the configuration. Uh, with the local mode, uh, this is kind of what everybody's been talking about. So this gives you the ability to run everything on the hybrid client. So not only do I have that embedded web view anymore, I also now have a local web server running on this device. I have my YJ UI running on this device, and I can also have my business logic, data access layer, and even an embedded database all running on the device. So there's no need for any external remote web connection to a server. So uh, we've kind of talked about the architecture a little bit um, and kind of what YJ Hybrid is. Um, but now I'm going to get into more of the details about uh, what you can actually do with YJ Hybrid um, and how you interact with it. Uh, so with YJ Hybrid, when you add it to a project, you get access to the device singleton. So this device singleton is your gateway to all the information and interactions that are available in that hybrid client. Um, if I check the device info member, I can find information about the device's system. So what operating system I'm running, what is the name of the device, um, what is the device's model, and then I have information about versioning. So I can determine if this is the first time this executable was ever launched, if this is the first time this executable was launched for the current build, um, or if um, this is the first build for, or the first version of this application that's been installed on the device. Um, in terms of the file system, you have access to um, the system directories. So you can read and write um, the documents folder, the downloads folder, uh, the cache folder, data, the project folder itself. Um, all of that information is available to read. Um, you also have access to the battery and network. With the battery, you can determine what is the current battery percentage of the device. Uh, what is, is that device connected to an external power source or is it running on battery? Um, is that device running in energy saver mode? Um, that all kind of fits in with the battery state. Network state, kind of similar. Um, if you can determine, is the device connected over a Wi-Fi connection? Is it connected over a cellular connection? and you can get information about when that changes. So um, I can read information from the device, but I can also change things on the device. So using one line of code here, I'm able to change the status bar background color of, a, um, of the device. I can also read and write values from the device's preferences. So that is a key value pair collection that's stored on the device. So this value persists when you restart the application. So if I uh, enter some value, save it, uh, force close the application, and then reload it, I'll still have access to that data. Um, you can also interact with the device's tab bar on certain platforms. So Android and iOS have native tab bars and toolbars. Um, and so you can uh, assign items to those uh, to that 
tap our toolbar um, with a few lines of code. Okay, uh, in terms of events, um, you can get information when things on the device changes. Uh, so when the connectivity of the device changes. So if I'm building that offline application, I might want to know when uh, the device goes offline or the device goes back online um, when that um, network status changes. Uh, and that's done using this connectivity to change event. Um, so inside of there, I can determine what is the new state of the network connection. Does it have access to internet? Does it not have access? Um, and then I can synchronize any data I collected while I was offline uh, with my remote database. Um, you can also get information when the user clicks a shortcut. So with YJ Hybrid, um, you can register shortcuts that um, on your home screen when you have an application and you hold it down or right click it, you'll see a list of quick actions. So you might have something like home settings, profile, user, whatever it is. Um, when you click one of those shortcuts, you can get an event in YJ, which allows you to show a specific view within your application. Um, you also have access to push notifications um, and orientation change events. So these are some of the other integrations um, that we've done with YJ Hybrid. Uh, so you can integrate Face ID, Touch ID, or Windows Hello uh, into your application with a few lines of code. So that's what we see in this uh, Visual Studio screenshot here. Inside of the button click handler, I'm calling device, which is my uh, hybrid client gateway, use, and then the name of the uh, extension. So we have an extension for this authentication called device authentication. Uh, and then we call a method authenticate that takes the reason for authentication. Uh, and so this is a modal operation, meaning that the server is going to wait for my hybrid client to respond before continuing execution onto line 20 and 21 here. Um, but by that point, I will have the result of that uh, authentication operation. Uh, there's also other features like barcode scanning, document scanning, uh, text or optical character recognition scanning, um, and both local and remote push notifications. Uh, this is an example of the barcode scanning integration. So for Android, this is based on Google's MLKit framework. And on iOS, this is based on Apple's Vision or Core ML framework. Um, and so you can see once again in Visual Studio, I'm uh, calling this barcode scanner with one or two lines of code uh, using that same kind of convention, device.use, the name of the extension, and then a method, scan barcode, that takes in a configuration for the scanner. Um, so I can configure things like the line color or only to scan unique barcodes or um, what type of barcodes to detect, uh, that kind of thing. But in this case, I'm actually scanning nearly 16 barcodes at the same time. Um, I can also zoom the camera and minimize it, things that aren't normally available uh, through a traditional web browser. Um, and I, then I can flip the camera direction and show a preview overlay as well. Um, so this is one more example of that kind of uh, machine learning kit uh, integration. So this uses um, the optical character recognition. Uh, so in this case, I'm detecting the text on a license plate of this nice uh, Tesla here. Um, so I'm calling device, use device ML, scan text, config. Um, and so the way this kind of works is um, this call is in our application. And this call then goes to YJ Framework, which sends the message to .NET MAUI, which is our hybrid client. So once it reaches our hybrid client, we've created custom handlers that process and delegate that request to the appropriate um, platform and framework. Uh, so on Android, it gets delegated to MLKit, and on iOS, it gets delegated to Core ML. Uh, once that request is finished for scanning the image, the results go back up, and I have the text that was found inside of this image available as a string array. Uh, so we've spent uh, an enormous amount of time trying to uh, encapsulate this functionality and make it, or abstract this functionality and make it as easy to use as possible um, within your YJ applications. Okay, so that's enough uh, PowerPoint slides. Uh, so now we'll actually dive into Visual Studio and see what this kind of thing looks like. Can you still see my screen, I think? 
Yes. Oh, good. Okay. Anyway. Perfect. Okay. So with YJ35, when you're creating a new project, you'll see three new templates that are available in Visual Studio. So I have my YJ Hybrid Remote Application Project Template. So this is the one where I'm deploying it to Azure or AWS or on-premise. Um, and then I have my hybrid client application. So this is the one that's generating the executable um, and that contains our embedded web view. Um, and then I have a hybrid local application. So this is the one that contains that embedded web server um, and runs entirely on the device. Um, to start, I'm going to create the hybrid client application. And it takes a bit to uh, open up in Visual Studio, but here we go. OK, so uh, now I have my um, project here. Not sure if I can move that. Uh, anyways, so if any of you have worked with .NET MAUI before, uh, this project format uh, might look familiar to you. So this is a highly customized .NET MAUI project specific for YJ Hybrid. Um, so inside of here, we have our platforms folder. So within this, um, only code or only that platform will execute that code. So under Android, I have Android specific code. Um, and I also have my configuration file for Android. So if you've ever built an Android project before, you're probably used to that Android manifest file. So you'll find that within your projects here. Um, and inside of that, and the same goes with the iOS info plist XML file, you can define what permissions your application uses. So if you're going to use the camera or you're going to use uh, geolocation or anything like that, you can define it in those manifest files. Um, so I have those configuration files for every platform. And then inside of the resources folder, I have my app icon. So whatever I see on my home screen or Windows desktop, and then I have the splash screen. Um, and so the splash screen is the first thing I'll see when the application opens up. Um, and so these are all just SVG files. Um, and so you're able to replace those within the project. Um, inside of the styles folder, there's some XAML uh, style and color configurations. Um, they aren't very important for this uh, example, um, but they are there if you need to customize something. Um, and the other important file within this project is the startup file. So this is similar to the .NET MAUI startup. You'll even see MAUI app create builder here and use MAUI app here. Um, but you'll see a couple extra things as well. So um, inside of here, I have uh, use YJ hybrid middleware. And I also have this one, which is commented out, use YJ offline. Uh, so this first one, use YJ hybrid, this lets the MAUI application know that this uh, app needs to start the embedded web view um, and it needs to load this startup URL. So if I'm using that remote application template or if I'm adding YJ hybrid to an existing project that I already have, uh, I would enter that URL here. Uh, and once you do that, the when the executable starts, the application will launch. Um, and then I have this localhost 5000 URL. So this is the default, um, and this is for offline applications. Uh, so I'm going to add a new project to the solution now. And we'll create an offline application. So I'm going to select the hybrid local application here. OK, and then uh, what, the way I link these two projects is through a project reference inside of my hybrid client. So I'm going to right click dependencies, add project reference, and then reference this new local offline project um, that I just added. Uh, and then I'm going to, I'm still in the startup file for the hybrid client. So I'm going to uncomment this line here. And I'm going to import the namespace of my local application. And that's it. Now my two projects are linked. So when I start up this hybrid client, um, I'm going to get my um, locally hosted offline application. Um, and when you look at the project structure of this hybrid local application, um, it probably looks very familiar to your standard YJ project. So I have a themes folder, I have a fav icon, I have offline HTML, uh, and so this corresponds to default HTML and the same for offline JSON and offline program. Uh, so we just renamed them uh, to um, 
clarify that you are running offline, but they the functionality is the exact same. Um, and then inside of this offline startup, we see here, um, this is the one that we uncommented in the other projects. Um, so this actually starts our embedded web server. So we're opening a port on, we're opening port 5000, and then we're starting the embed IO web server. And we're injecting that YJ middleware to that. Um, so that's all we need. Uh, I'm going to open my page here and actually show one of those device integrations. So we'll add a button to the designer here. And I'll add a, a really descriptive uh, text to it with me. Okay, and then when I double click, I get the handler for it. Um, and this is where I can start interacting with that device singleton, that device gateway. So I'm gonna do device dot popups display alert. And the title of the message, welcome. And then the actual message, hello world. Okay, and that's all I need to do. Now I can run this on Windows. So let's see if I can press it here. And our application should build. And with this, I'm targeting .NET 8, right? Um, but it's up to you. There are ways to run this with .NET 7 and .NET 6. Um, but by default, our templates use .NET 8. Uh, and with that, um, your Visual Studio version will need to be, I believe it's at least 17.8 uh, to run um, .NET 8. But anyways, uh, so this is our application. So I'm running as a Windows executable here. Um, I can see it in my taskbar, and then I click my button, and I get my native pop-up. Um, sorry, I didn't mean to stop running that, actually. Um, I can also use Hot Reload to make changes to the application in real time. So um, instead of... Instead of displaying the alert, I could collect user input. So I could do var result equals device popups display prompt. Okay, and so I have welcome, and then I'm gonna change the message to enter your name. And once we have the result of that uh, prompt, I'm gonna show it in the alert box. And let's click hot reload. I think that's hot reload. Click, and now I have my prompts. Enter your name, Levi, and I get my alert box down here. So um, I kind of breezed over it, but inside of this hybrid client, this will always be your startup project or offline projects. Um, inside of the dropdown in Visual Studio here, you'll see the different targets you can run on. So um, by default, it's Windows, um, but I can also select an Android emulator that I've created on my device, or I can select a local um, iPhone that's connected to my computer, even if it's on Windows, um, or I can attach to connect to a Mac that's on my network, um, and then I can run on a device that's connected to that. Um, but I am going to show you it on Android. So I have built the same application on Android here, and we're going to run it. So this is that splash screen um, showing what the startup of the application looks like. You don't really see that on Windows, um, but you will see it on the mobile devices. Okay, so now I have my uh, button again and I have my prompt. So I'm going to click welcome. And now I see I have that Android native uh, prompt. So I enter my name. OK, uh, and I get welcome. Um, but this works the exact same way um, as Windows. I mean, you can step into it. You can step over. Um, you can use all of the debugging tools that are available in Visual Studio. Um, when you're debugging your Android, your iOS application, you can even use Hot Reload in here. Um, all of that's available without issue. OK, so um, hopping back to the presentation quickly. Um, so that is kind of 
uh, how you can get started with YJ Hybrid. Um, in terms of deployment, everything's done using the Visual Studio Publishing tool. Uh, when you use the Visual Studio Publishing tool, you're either going to generate um, an APK file or an ESC or an IPA file, um, and you can directly connect it to your App Store Connect account or the Google Play Store. Um, and then from there, you can either choose whether I'm doing a public or private um, application deployment. Um, but this process is the same as .NET MAUI. So um, if you get stuck when you're actually publishing an app, check the .NET MAUI documentation um, because it's the exact same thing. Uh, so this is our hybrid uh, showcase application, which you've seen a couple screenshots of. Um, and so this shows the different integrations that are available on every platform. Uh, so I have integrations for um, the authentication, the barcode scanners, uh, information about the device, uh, the device sensors like accelerometer. Um, you can play around with all of that. Um, if you're interested in downloading it on your phone, there's the links for uh, Test Flight, which is iOS, and the Google Play Store for Android. And um, one last slide. So YJ, in a, YJ Hybrid in a nutshell. You just need to know C Sharp or VB. Everything you do is in Visual Studio using that YJ designer, dragging and dropping controls from the toolbox onto the designer um, and running it either locally uh, as an offline application or connected to some remote web server. Um, you're able to use all of the controls that are available in YJ and all the controls that are available in .NET MAUI. Um, YJ and YJ Hybrid are your complete technology stack for web, mobile, and desktop development. But yeah, that's all I have for you guys. So thank you for your time. Uh, thank you very much, Levi. Um, and it's always fascinating to just uh, listen to you and uh, uh, watch what you've been uh, building um, together with the rest of the team. Um, and uh, I think Wysha Hybrid is, is, is really a, a very uh, interesting technology um, that uh, should be helpful and very useful for a lot of scenarios. Um, so thank you once again uh, for, for this deep dive. Um, I've seen a number of questions rolling in um, and I think it's a, it's a good moment to grab some of them and uh, go back and um, um, answer them. Um, we had some questions in the chat. Uh, we also have uh, a few questions in the Q&A um, system um, of, of the Zoom client. Um, so let me um, pick up some of them. Um, if we are not able to go through all of them, um, we'll make sure that we follow up with you guys and um, share the feedback. Um, but uh, first of all, uh, let me raise um, let me raise my uh, one of the first questions that we had. I think the the first one that is is one that I would like to pick up actually. And uh, Florian asked. Um, if and for how long hybrid will be around because uh, he said that why the mobile was there for a couple of years but actually not too long why are we releasing hybrid now and what happens to mobile and i think the answer is um the step up from mobile to hybrid is is so convincing in terms of features and functionality and technology it was um the i, th I think the right choice to to really bet on on hybrid because it really lets you share the code um, for mobile we always had the two projects uh, set up we had a technology that was more bound to the certain device uh, and hybrid explore expands on so many more features um technically speaking uh that it's the the much more interesting and, and much more reliable and stable technology for the future um, it also addresses one thing that we had um, in our portfolio calling Wiseshit on a desktop, um, which was a way that we had for some time already to deploy Wiseshit web-based applications as a fat client solution. And therefore, we decided to pull these things together, Wiseshit mobile Android, iOS, and Wiseshit desktop, um, wrapping it up with hybrid. And therefore, hybrid is an essential part of our strategy. It will be around, um, and there is there are no plans uh, to have a short period of life here. Um, it's just the opposite. I think it's a great foundation moving forward since we were able to address some of the weaknesses of the former solutions, especially the offline access for which we now have a solution. So um, I think it's it's convincing, and um, for existing mobile applications, there should be an easy upgrade path. But maybe uh, Levi, that's one question that you can also address because the device object has been around before 
and some of the local um, interfaces uh, we have with mobile are also there with hybrid. Uh, is there anything that's not working on the hybrid solution that we have on mobile? Uh, no, there shouldn't be any uh, feature that's available in YJ Mobile that's not available in YJ Hybrid. Um, but when migrating from YJ Mobile to YJ Hybrid, um, there are some refactoring uh, and naming changes um, that occurred. Um, there's many more features that are available in YJ Hybrid than were available in YJ Mobile. Um, and with YJ Hybrid, um, it's much more scalable. Everything we're doing is from one code base now, instead of developing something on Android and then developing something on iOS and Swift and Xcode. Um, and so this one shared code base makes it much easier to build new features uh, for YJ Hybrid. Yes, um, the other thing is um, it's, it's, uh, it's a new application, it's, an, it's a new technology, um, but we have been working with some of you guys um, that have been working with a beta version or early early beta versions already. So um, the screenshot for the, for example, the barcode scanning, it actually came out of a real business case. Um, and uh, uh, the customer that, that's using that um, is, is also with us today. Um, so we are really in close contact. Um, and some of you have reached out to us early when they heard about the plans with hybrid. Um, they got good access to early releases. And uh, we've been working on real life scenarios with the technology. It is new, yes, um, but I think uh, it's really a, a great solution, a great version already for the start, and we really encourage you to start using it. Um, another question that came up, um, is it only supporting C Sharp, or does, uh, does hybrid work with any dialect, any .NET language, such as also VB.NET, or Levi? Yep, so we've, with YJ35, we've released the templates for uh, Visual Basic as well. The only thing that's not available in Visual Basic is that hybrid client, um, but you're really not changing much within that project itself. Most of the work that you're going to be doing is um, in that hybrid local application or the remote application that we saw from earlier. Um, so I don't think you should run into many issues with that. Um, but yes, the VB templates for building hybrid applications are available. All right. Yeah. Thank you. Um, another question that that I pick here from from the list of uh, things that came in is: um, Are third party components and the premium extension supported on hybrid, um, or is it just the control set um, on the, the with Bysha, um controls that we we offer natively along with with Bysha? Yeah, so with YJ35, we went through all of the extensions um, and we made them compatible with YJ Hybrid, um, including the premium extensions. Um, so with that, um, I would add that to a project the same way as I would my regular YJ project. The only consideration that you'll have with that um, is if you're using one of those premium extensions like Sync Fusion or Telerik or DevExpress, um, and you add it out of the box to that YJ designer, that is relying on a CDN URL. Um, and so if you want to run that project entirely offline, you'll have to locally deploy all of the source code for that uh, premium extension as well. Um, but yes, in terms of compatibility, there, there shouldn't be any issues. Mm -hmm. um, another question that we that I see here in the chat is, um, um, is YJ Hybrid already available? Um, or when will it be released? Um, that's probably an easy one to answer. Yeah. Yep, it's available now. So if you download the latest VI, VSIX installer from the YJ site, um, you'll see those three new project templates inside of Visual Studio. Okay. Um, there was a question about uh, deployment to Linux. Um, um, we mentioned Windows, we mentioned Mac OS, iOS, Android. Is it possible to deploy to Linux? Um, I'm not sure if the question goes for YJ.NET itself or hybrid. For YJ.NET, um, it's easy to answer. Um, if you're on, on .NET, which means uh, .NET Core, .NET 6, um, then Linux deployment is uh, certainly possible. You can also deploy to uh, the Azure App Service plans, for example. Um, but it depends also on your application. If you're coming from 4.8 and you have some references to things that are only available in the .NET framework unrelated to YJ, um, you may have to resolve those, those um, references and, and those interfaces. Um, with a uh, hybrid, Levi, is there a path for a Linux app, um, for a Linux desktop? Um, 
Yeah, I mean, it depends on whatever the .NET MAUI team comes out with. So the moment that they start supporting a Linux desktop, um, we could do the same. Um, but uh, that's probably a bit down the road. So I wouldn't, I wouldn't plan on that anytime soon. Um, another question that came in was, um, how can you push an update to a hybrid app? That's a great question. Uh, so there's two different routes. So if you're using that hybrid remote application, uh, then you make that change on your remote web server on IIS or you know Kestrel or wh wherever your application is hosted. Um, if you deploy that uh, application locally embedded on the device, the changes are pushed through the App Store. So you'll have to um, do that Visual Studio publishing tool to generate a new APK, a new AAB, new IPA, uh, and then you'll have to upload that to the corresponding App Store with an incremented version number. Um, and that's, other than that, um, that's how you make the updates. Okay. Um, I, I have two more questions here um, that I pick. I think there are they have, they have even a few more. We will not be able to go through all of them, but um, we'll make sure that they're they are getting answered. So um, please uh, continue pasting your questions and we'll pick them up uh, from the log and uh, follow up with you. Um, but uh, two things that I would like to pick up. Uh, one is... Um, I think this question was raised a couple of times um, with YHDA.NET 3.5 and also hybrid. Um, does the YHDA designer still require .NET 4.8? That was one question that was raised here in the chat. Uh, yeah. Uh, so with um, the current build, YHDA 3.5, you will need that .NET framework 4.8 designer. Um, there have been potential talks about um, in YJ.NET 4 removing that .NET framework dependency um, and making the designer .NET Core. Um, and maybe Luca could speak more to that. Um, but in general, right now, um, you still need .NET framework when you're using the designer. Yeah. Uh, yeah. <clears throat> let me let me um, let me address. Can you hear me? Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Let me address that quickly. Um, in the roadmap on our website, <clears throat> removing the .NET 44.8, uh, sorry, .NET framework dependency is scheduled for .NET 4. So now that we go 3.5 out of the way, you're going to focus on, on that. Um, the main issue there is the what, uh, Visual Studio Designer for .NET Core has been moved to an auto process model. Uh, we already have some uh, prototyping for that, but uh, we couldn't really dedicate it too much time to that, uh, but we will for .NET 4. So until then, you need .NET framework for the designer. For .NET 4, you will not need it anymore. Okay. Thomas, I'm also typing some answers to the Q&A. Um, yes. Uh, okay, so I'm, I'm, I'm answering directly on the Q&A, but um, I guess having a spoken answer is also. Yeah, we will, we will collect a, um, a, a list of questions to answer to pass around later on. Um, so um, I think uh, some of the things will be uh, answered while we are still here uh, in the session. But uh, even when, when you log out later on, um, I'll make sure that the questions get answered um, and they have it in our documentation and pass it around. One last question uh, that I would like to raise, um, if, and uh, we'll soon ask Amit uh, to, to join us and give us uh, yeah, some insight on, on his work. Uh, but one last question, Levi, was around hardware interfaces. Um, what are there uh, or what kind of interfaces do we support on local devices? And do we plan to continue implementing more of them? Yeah, that's another great question. Um, so we're constantly trying to um, add new premium or new hybrid extensions that will uh, cover these kinds of interfaces. Um, and so one that we've been working on um, is the Bluetooth. Um, integration. So we've been trying to create a reusable Bluetooth extension, which allows you to communicate with um, external Bluetooth devices, such as um, a barcode reader or um, any other type of you know, device that can send uh, information. Um, but all of these things should be able to be integrated in YJ Hybrid, um, which is one of the reasons we chose to go with YJ Hybrid instead of the separate packages for Xcode, Xcode and Android Studio because implementing these kinds of local hardware interfaces would be much more difficult on each independent platform. So having um, this shared code base, um, it's much easier for us to integrate those local hardware interfaces. Excellent. Cool. 
yeah, once again, uh, thank you, Levi, um, for for the feedback. Um, and um, um, as I said, we're going to collect um, the all the questions and make sure that you're getting the answers uh, that you're looking for. Uh, I'm very sorry, our schedule is a little bit limited um, with uh, some of the other things that we wanted to share with you. Um, so we follow up with the questions by email later on. Um, and now I would like to bring Amit um, to the stage. Uh, Amit, uh, a very warm well welcome. Uh, it's great to have you with us today, tonight. And uh, well, this morning actually for you, because uh, Amit is also connecting from the East Coast uh, in the US. And um, yeah, feel free to share your screen. The stage is yours. Uh, let me see if I. All right, can you can you see my screen? Yes, you can. All right, can you hear me? All okay. Yes, sound is fine. All right. All right, thank you, uh, thank you, Thomas, and um, I do appreciate the uh, um, thank you for the kind words as well as uh, the opportunity to kind of talk about our experience and our work with the ISTE Group and YSJ in particular. And when, when Thomas and Luca kind of um, asked us to kind of, you know, um, talk about Amtec and it was important to talk about, you know, our, the last five years that we've been, uh, you know, working together in terms of uh, our migration first in terms of the on Korea ERP. And then uh, recently we've just taken on the uh, development and completed the project for uh, the advanced planning board. So I'll, I'll quickly go through some of these slides and then we can jump into the application and kind of showcase you what we've developed this year. Uh, real quick, um, Amtec, uh, our company is established in 1981. We're a leading provider of uh, software and hardware solutions for the corrugated and folding cotton manufacturing industries. And since we have an audience around the world, what that means in, in some parts of the world, it's called cardboard. Like this and we have folding cotton men. So our customers are basically producing these, either producing these sheets or converting them into boxes. What sets Amtec apart is our deep understanding of our uh, the, the manufacturing processes of 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 this industry, right? And we provide this comprehensive suite, and our flagship Encore ERP com it consists basically of modules and applications, soup to nuts from estimating coding all the way to shipping and in, invoicing, accounting, and much more. And also we, we, we're renowned for our commitment to customizations and adaptability. Our ERP is flexible. We are able to adjust, change, config according to our customers' needs. So um, about five or six years ago, we, I mean, our ERP has been in, in the market for close to 30 years written in SQL Windows, Gupta. Um, and then we, we recently took the migration, like I said, to YSJ uh, to modernize the web-based application. And Mark Hanslick, our, our uh, chief architect and uh, CTO, kind of laid it very straightforward in terms of our primary goal where, you know, the, the whole premise of this migration was to empower our users, our customers with access anytime, anywhere or any device. It's 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 a simple goal, but it's a huge goal considering the large scale um, of our application and the amount of customers that we have. Uh, so one of the biggest challenges was ensuring uh, continuity and you know uh, during implementation with all these customers. So that that in itself uh, provided that challenge, and the solution was to make sure that we are preserving all the software business logic that has been built over the years. And we've achieved that with working with IST Group and having a successful project with the Onco ERP migration. And uh, customers see the benefits, especially moving to the web uh, uh, during COVID and post COVID, we see all the customers getting the benefits of a web-based application. So they are, they've got efficiencies, they are, they are able to have their users run the system on the web. So it's it's been a very, very good uh, uh, experience. So as part of uh, our Amtec roadmap for, for 2022, we had a scheduling module, which was basically written in C++. Um, just to give a background, we can go through the features in the app, but it simply said it's a scheduling tool for the for our customers. 
it has automation behind it where it's churning orders and creating an optimal schedule from the ERP. And uh, this application was written in C++ about 20, 20 years ago. And the whole premise was was to kind of rebuild this from scratch. But uh, having said that, we had some of the requirements that um, we, we, we had to create an application that is completely redesigned with a new user interface so that we can actually be ahead of our competition, right? So in, in doing so, we, we want to make sure our schema and our backend architecture remain the same. So that kind of minimizes some of the risks. And we had to we had to put special emphasis on key features like the planning board GAN, as well as the KPIs that provide metrics to the uh, users in terms of how their machines are running, their capacities, and how the schedules are running. Along with that, YC allowed us to close some of the gaps that were in the old application, which were very hard to build because of the limitation of the technology. So YC, using YC, we were able to kind of modernize this application. Our development experience has been, it's been interesting. We've had, we've had the uh, modernize as well as take the experience of building new applications. So when I talk about YC development, I can talk for the team YC offers a smooth migration path from traditional desktop to modern web-based applications. In a sense, developers can leverage their existing C Sharp, Visual Studio, their familiar development environments and build these rich modern web-based applications. But having said that, it also empowers some of the, you know, these uh, the, the front-end developers who are really good at HTML5, JavaScript, the open source technologies because YC allows you to hook onto those and build these sophisticated integrations and enhancements. And lastly, I want to kind of mention the tools itself provides a lot of rich features out of the box. For example, the grid components, the uh, the, the response of containers, uh, localization. So there's tons of features that we were able to use and build these features, use these features to create provide rich value to our customers. So this is a screenshot of how the planning board looked in the, or still looks the C++, which a lot of customers are migrating now to the new one. And this is a screenshot of the new one. So like, as you can see, the whole theme of our application was the visual in terms of making an impact in terms of providing the user as much information without them looking for it, making sure that we are creating an intuitive interface aiming to present all the ERP data with minimal user navigation. So without further ado, let me quickly jump onto the demo. Can anybody see the screen? All right. Yes, we can we can see the planning board application. I mean okay. So that's our login page. In terms of the frame, and if you look, if it truly is a single page application where the, the SPA com comprises of a navigation bar, the YSA controls at the top, which is a tab control. We have the status control. And for the planning board, we are we are actually integrating with the control core Brintum and IST Group helped us build that integration to that uh, JavaScript control. Um, as you can see, this this control and all the data that the control needs is being plumbed through just standard C sharp, um, you know, C sharp coding, and and, and we're just uh, allowing uh, YC allows us to do that by virtue of you know. Uh, sending this data back to the client. So, like as you can see, the the the, the icons, the colors, um, uh, the as you hover over the non-available time, you can see the calendars. Uh, this is the non-working time. These are the recurring time, downtime. So, this this uh, this integration was really really powerful in terms of the features that are provided. So. As a scheduler, we can move on from 
the the board to the lineup page. The lineup page is where traditionally the 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 users are looking at their lineups in terms of grids, and the YC grids also have you know the, the, the drag and drop features that we are able to get into edit mode and maybe you know use some movements to to kind of do this rich easier flow of the of, of drag and drops where you can just quickly do this and and you're able to see that visually up top as well so these containers are responsive you can close them maximize them the most powerful integration and in the features that we, we I think our customers really are loving is the dev express integration that we have currently uh with with the uh, with the application. I'm trying to see why it's not loading right now. It's interesting. Oh, thank you, Patik. <laughs> we don't do dashboards in edit mode. So the dashboards are basically allowing our schedulers to to view their machine capacities and their utilizations and 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 to give them drill downs in, in terms of how the machines are running, what are they running, and what's the availability, the the, the non availability. So that that's a, that's information that goes back to the CSRs so that they can react to that to and make their decisions accordingly. So the, these drill downs work, and then they, you can you can drill down further to the downtime, to the non-working time, and understand how your how your plants are running. Um, in terms of uh, the layouts, I mean, we, we've created this job details panel, which allows the schedulers to quickly have access to the ERP data, which we call this is a universe. This is our universal job details panel, which is a as you can see, this is all the tabs. This is information coming from the ERP system, uh, whether it's you know the, the job information, the routing, the holes, uh, comments. Uh, this allows the scheduler to be in the scheduling system and not have to go away from any other uh, from this system. And the, uh, the ability to see the job tickets. Now, this panel is interesting. You, this panel will be available from the orders, from from the lineup and it's reactive to clicks from wherever you are at. There's some really nice features that the team has built in terms of quick searches, you know, where you can just type in the, the job numbers and you can be able to see where your job is and you can you can kind of look at that and it, it highlights you the the job shows you all the dependencies where the machine what machines the job is scheduled for um so on and so forth yep and the same thing is available across the board where you are able to see those jobs and it, if it if it's there it's going to highlight and select the job in the in the in the lineup so we call this our global search. I'd like to also point out some of the UIs that we've created are uh, the grids with where you're able to create uh, different types of controls within rows, rows and cells, which traditionally with coming from a .NET and a Windows forms and ASP.NET background, it's it was used to be very hard to kind of do those things, but YC allows you to build these very, very quickly. Um, the other kind of controls that we build are, uh, or the controls that we are using are uh, the split containers, and you'll see how responsive these are. Amit, uh, let me jump in here quickly. Um, mm -hmm. It's uh, it, it's really fascinating because when you um, think of the amount of data that has to be displayed here, especially mm -hmm. showing a gun and the type of scrolling that you are showing. Yeah, um, I know a little bit about Amtech, and uh, it's 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 just massive amounts of data that that are processed here. 
Yeah, um, so yeah. that's the reason why you did um, develop the earlier version in C++. Um, and to me, it looks it looks really fast on the web. But at the same time, uh, let me ask you a question. How, how much time uh, did it take you to develop this? I mean, it looks like a multi-year project. <laughs> well, no, it, it is actually was, uh, we started the proof of concept last year, November, December, and we fully onboarded the team and we began development in uh, January, February this year. And we just completed the project in October. So seven months, yep. Seven months. And yeah, uh, may, the team I ask, really, yeah. may I ask how many people you had on the team? A uh, team of uh, four or uh, five, actually. Wow. That's really impressive. Uh, congratulations. Uh, yeah, I'm, thank I'm, you. I'm, I'm really deeply impressed with what you did here. And uh, I must say, thank you very much for sharing this with us. Um, it's, uh, it's a very specialized application for a very um, uh, a special industry. Um, but uh, it's really interesting for me. I see it live for the first time. I've, I saw some screenshots before, but it's really interesting to see and 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 what you build yep. made out of it. Really, yeah, cool. we, we are very excited. And yep. Quick, quick question: I mean, how, how many machines and how many jobs? How many tasks? Well, when we did our benchmark in in when we our development uh, uh, stress test in terms of when we when we started developing when we wanted to pick the tool, we we looked at the highest number of jobs were 10,000. So we're looking at loading 10,000 tasks in the Gantt at a given time. Jesus, and, and push that to the client, right? You push can to the client. client, so, yep, exactly. And as you can see here, we have we have um, threads running in the background and on the server side, that's gonna see now there's a refresh happening and there's a new schedule in process. And within, within a minute of this going away, the, all the clients are going to get reflected and the Gantt and all the grids will reflect. So that's ha that's happening right now. It just happened. <laughs> 10,000 jobs. So. Very impressive. Um, and it's also, I think it's a, it's a great story. And that's also why we invited you today. It's I mean, we really enjoy working with you guys. Um, but it's also an interesting story be because originally we, we went to came together migrating from desktop to the web with YJ, which was the core focus. And then at one point you had to decide uh, how to move on and yep, how you're yep. going to do new stuff. And Yeah, yeah. And it's been in the last couple of years, we've started doing pure YJ applications internally, you know, just internal apps. And so the decision to move towards, you know, using YJ for this application was very natural, having built, having the Encore running on the YJ as well as so we wanted to create something that's tightly integrated, right? So um, the, the choice of uh, the technology was actually very simple. It was really deciding upon the, the integrations and you know uh, the controls that we would use for the Gantt as well as on the on and then on the dashboard. You, uh, uh, ICQ was already providing a premium extension for the Dev Express, so that worked out very very well. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you. Um, and actually, it's a, it's, a, it's a good hint. Um, the the Dev Express dashboard um, is also used by some of our other clients around the world. We have uh, customers in South America using the component, and uh, have from others as well. Um, if you need a dashboard feature, especially one that allows interactive editing um, and changing um, of of dashboards, you may want to take a look at it. It's a great uh, extension um, and uh, does uh, does a lot of stuff. So it's, it can be a big step forward for an existing application. Yep. Yep. Completely. All right. All right. Thank you Thank very you. much. Thank you. That's. We really appreciate um, uh, that that you that you shared uh, all of this with us today. Um, so so once again, thank you for for joining, and I would also like to welcome Dino Esposito. Um, he uh, he just joined us uh, from Italy. Um, I think Dino, you're connected from Rome um, today. Um, great to have you with us. And um, we are really interested in uh, hearing your your thoughts um, about architecting web applications for the enterprise, which has been a topic for you for two decades at the least, maybe three. Years. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, yeah. Really happy to have you with us today, um, and uh, maybe you can introduce yourself uh, a bit more. I, I shared a few words already earlier, but I'm not sure if I covered everything. Uh, so uh, a very warm welcome, and uh, the stage is yours. Thank you. Uh, again, you, you hear me correctly, right? Yes, we don't see okay. you at the moment. Um, yeah, okay, okay. That, you, you, I just uh, turn on uh, the, um, the video, in, uh, so you, you should be able to, to see me. 
uh, hopefully. Uh, yeah. Okay. Uh, so let me take the stage. Um, and uh, okay, I want to continue. Uh, here we go. This is it. Here it goes. And okay, so uh, well, um, I spent uh, probably more than a couple of decades uh, uh, working with uh, ASP.NET since the very, very, very beginning. As I like to uh, to mention uh, uh, in public audiences, uh, there was a time in which uh, the uh, official father uh, of ASP.NET, uh, his goodness, Scott Guthrie, uh, the executive VP of Microsoft now uh, is uh, was uh, was less popular than I was. That happened, uh, uh, you know, in in the late nineties, early two thousands. Then ASP.NET came, and uh, I was uh, not by my decision, but because I got an offer from Microsoft Press to write uh, a book on programming the web with ASP.NET. I started. A new career. I started my official career as a C developer, C and C++ developer, uh, working on Windows applications for the most part. I became a web developer and then I, I made up my career. So I believe that in, in, in a couple of decades, uh, I grounded uh, a significant uh, experience and I've seen quite a few things uh, that summarized make up for uh, this sort of uh, sinusoidal uh, function uh, graph you see on screen that shows uh, how essentially uh, the, the, the web development trends and uh, the attractiveness to uh, developers and influencers moved over the past two uh, decades. Uh, you may remember that, but in the 90s, uh, uh, mid 90s, at the very beginning of the internet era, all web pages were pure HTML. Uh, so the invention, so to speak, of server side rendering uh, through uh, PHP and then active server pages uh, appeared to many like, wow, the idea of the century. ASP.NET came at the top of this uh, growing curve uh, of interest and uh, empowerment. Uh, and ASP.NET uh, represented a significant peak because it brought desktop side, desktop style, client side oriented development to the web. In the, when ASP.NET came out, uh, and I understand that this may be may sound weird to uh, the, the, the newest generations of web developers, but when ASP.NET came up, the, the majority of developers were looking at the web like a freaky thing not to take seriously. Uh, so the, the success of ASP.NET is just rooted in the fact that the slogan was, uh, you just use this platform and we shield you entirely from the intricacy um, and the weirdness uh, of HTML, CSS, JavaScript, and all those uh, web-like things. You just code your way using a serious programming language like C Sharp or Visual Basic.net if you if you were in that uh, in that segment, and you build your app. So building applications for the web, building and rewriting enterprise applications became a matter of learning a sort of client-side oriented uh, component-based uh, framework and just do your stuff. Over the few years, as uh, the, uh, the smartest of the new developers brought to the web, started realizing that the real power uh, of the the, the browser and the client-side programming, no matter the browser wars uh, of the early 2000s. But at some point they said, well, uh, we, what if we make uh, the 
life within the browser a little bit more entertaining? Uh, why should we every time for every single interaction go to refresh from scratch the page? It's not just a matter of, of experiencing the flashing of the page, but it's also a matter of, you know, spending time for the re-download of all things. Uh, so there was a movement that was essentially bringing back the, uh, going down the slope of the curve uh, towards, again, HTML. Uh, in, the, in the middle of this, uh, uh, the blue curve, there was a time about... Uh, less than a decade ago, in which uh, silver light appeared like a meteor, um, bringing the idea that probably there was something radically different we could do on the client uh, running uh, silver light was a plugin these days a, de a decade later uh, the, the idea of the plugin disappeared replaced by a web assembly uh, sandbox uh, within the browser so essentially these days the browser has uh, uh, just a couple of sandboxes you can choose from one is hosting javascript code the other one is hosting web assembly compatible uh, code uh today and then the the, the 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 red the, the red ball we are you know if, you, if we go with the the, the trends of web development going again towards a, a pure HTML and it's a funny story uh, because uh, this is due to the fact that over the past few years uh, the the development on on the front end became so complex and so rich in JavaScript and TypeScript uh, that just uh, the show up the first appearance of the application is taking considerable amount of time so why not going back to html that renders uh, the complex structure of the page as plain html string so that the browser can render it immediately and then the magic starts with interaction anyway uh, we went through uh, essentially a few general purpose abstract architectures, the classic web application in which there was a browser, uh, one or more applications, uh, the, the web farm, web garden, or single server model of the beginning, with the communication going through plain HTTP and the extension of AJAX to make uh, uh, changes within the client uh, uh, less intrusive, smoother, and uh, giving users a much better experience. Then uh, the modern architecture for applications of this time in which there is a neat separation between front-end and back-end, which means that those two are distinct applications. The front-end is deployed as a standalone application. The back-end is deployed as a standalone application. The front-end hosts HTML, JavaScript, and whatever else is needed for uh, arranging the UI. The back-end just exposes a... I'm not sure if you're seeing the same thing as I do, but uh, Dino, can you hear us? I think we lost the connection. Yeah. Oh, that's too bad. Uh, let's wait a little second and see if he comes back in. Yeah, that's always the... Um, the difficult part about live events, uh, when something uh, breaks down, uh, then the, <laughs> there's nothing to change. Um, actually, um, I was supposed to be in the office today, um, and uh, this morning we had a wa water leakage um, in the floor above our office uh, space. So we had uh, a lot of water coming down, and um, I prefer to, to return to my home office to make sure that internet and power is working all right, uh, because we weren't sure 
um, how much more we would uh, suffer from the water leakage, um, and um, it uh, destroyed quite some uh, some 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 things in the office. Well, but that's the way it is with live events. Let's uh, let's wait a little more if uh, Dino comes back. Um, and um, I will uh, try to bridge the gap a little bit. Um, so um, let me let me share my screen again. Um, just a moment and see if he uh, um, if he's with us again in a in a couple of minutes. Uh, Thomas, could you? I've seen there are some questions about the licensing model for hybrid because it's different than our uh, previous uh, model. You want to address that? Yes, um, I can um, address that uh, briefly. Um, for Wiesha Hybrid, um, there is a starter edition that's available um, for a limited number of uh, deployments. Um, and that is available without an additional cost. So you can actually start exploring, working with, um, with um, hybrid um, um, without, without additional costs. Um, feel free to do that. And um, if you have larger deployment uh, scenarios, uh, we offer hybrid as an extension to our Wireshare and Active Technology Partner Program. And uh, the uh, licensing handbook was updated to reflect um, uh, these things. So uh, feel free to take a look. And if you have any questions around that or um, uh, need more details around uh, the way we handle it, then uh, just drop us a line um, and be happy to explore your requirements and uh, see how how we can make Wireshare Hybrid fit with your application needs. And uh, now I see, yes, I, Dino being back. back. Yeah, sorry about that. <laughs> no worries, no worries. Uh, we uh, just pitched the gap a little bit. Um, yep. And uh, <laughs> um, yeah, feel free to share your screen again um, uh, and yeah. take over. Yes. Yeah, okay. So um, uh, we were here essentially. Yeah, okay. So th there are many reasons for um, for an enterprise to choose uh, an, a neat separation between front end and back end. Uh, the most reasonable uh, uh, perspective is to maintain distinct teams at work, uh, each totally or nearly um, significantly separated in terms of concerns from the other one. Um, but this is just the modern web applications. And like in artwork, we had uh, uh, we have a also a postmodern web application architecture, which is uh, the one that just these days is uh, is is being uh, is being uh, all the rage. We have uh, a front end as a standalone application. Uh, we have uh, a back end uh, that is now being in a way renamed with just API because that's it. It's just API. It, its only concern is exposing endpoints for the front end to call. And interestingly, on the server we have uh, we tend to have something that you know it's beautiful to call a microservices architecture, which basically means that you have a number of distinct blocks, each representing an API or a piece of the global API for the front end to call, but each. API, each microservice is uh, standalone and is uh, essentially independent from all the others and from the front end itself. Uh, this is in a way by design and that's a fact. So the front end faces the issue of aggregating information from multiple sources. So instead of uh, being able to always make a direct REST call via HTTP to one particular endpoint, most likely the front end has to aggregate data from a variety of uh, uh, microservices slash API. And this is the point in which REST is replaced by something called GraphQL, which is essentially just a way to arrange to construct uh, statically uh, a, 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 an interface, a programming interface for the data that can be retrieved and modified via API. It's just you. You can think of GraphQL just like an interface in, in as it, it is defined in programming languages, 
and the, the, the members of this interface are just the, uh, the data being exposed for reading and or writing by uh, the API. But the funny thing that uh, takes me to de de define this as a postmodern postmodernism of web applications is the fact that we not just have the front end, but uh, more than often, we have also a back end for the front end. This is funny because uh, taking the front end idea to its limit, so putting within the front end more and more and more tons and tons of JavaScript code uh, using I inevitable using anything like uh, uh, Angular or uh, React. It's a, a little bit better, but not that much if you go with Vue.js, the three big entities. Uh, there you have the problem that you know, bringing up, constructing the first impact, the first image of each page takes a while. Takes a while because uh, the, 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 the page is, uh, is not served by any server, but... Uh, multiple pieces of JavaScript and JSON data are downloaded within the browser. And then within the browser, JavaScript runs to build up the DOM, the real DOM for the first appearance of each page. Uh, and through frameworks like Universal within latest versions of Angular, but also Next, Nuxt, Nixt, and Next, there's a variety of uh, JavaScript frameworks uh, essentially Next and Nuxt, in particular for React and for Vue.js, they tend to compile server-side, so the back-end for the front-end, uh, the representation of the page done in a dialect, mostly TypeScript-oriented, supported by frameworks like Angular, React, and Vue, to play in HTML for the first rendering. So it happens that the browser receives, in, in the first time that a page is accessed, receives just HTML and can render up the HTML statically and quickly. And then any, in, any further interaction uh, takes place the usual way with download of JSON, a calling of uh, API endpoints, uh, and uh, uh, essentially the AJAX way. In this context, uh, ASP.NET Core, uh, even in the latest version 8 released uh, less than a month ago, um, is perceived as something that works beautifully, but only for the back end. This is a point that personally I tend to question a little bit. Uh, ASP.NET is uh, definitely... Uh, uh, working also for generating the front end. I can bring here my direct experience because I work for a company that is uh, uh, in sport tech. And what we do is uh, maintaining uh, uh, through a, a number, about 20 different uh, uh, web services, uh, we maintain and run operations, uh, daily operations for ten professional tennis and paddle uh, tournaments. So if you can bet on uh, the next point won by a player in a given tennis match in a given tournament in any part of the world, if you can uh, get live scoring, if uh, the same matches can be scheduled by emitting order of plays and creating draws, this is, is done for any level of professional tournaments in tennis and paddle. This is possible because of our platforms and all of our platforms are plain ASP.NET applications in which we take care surgically to uh, uh, implement the, 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 our custom virtual DOM in which we take care manually to update uh, pieces of the rendered DOM in such a way uh, we can give users uh, a smooth experience of changes. We do that manually and we can afford uh, that be mostly because our applications are not, I, I wouldn't call them enterprise data heavy applications, we are still uh, managing an amount of, of data and actions that allow us to deal that way also because our team is pretty much experienced in doing and working that way okay now 
the postmodern applications architecture is uh, representing 100% of the current reality. Anybody here having something like legacy applications? I believe so. I do have a legacy app. So how do you plan speaking in general? Because then every single project has its own pros and cons, right? So it has to be looked uh, uh, carefully and, and closely. But generally speaking, there is a pattern. And this pattern uh, you can use to reconsider, refactor uh, an old existing application that makes up your living. That is a line of business app. The key thing is identifying what I've called here an atomic segment. Atomic here is not necessarily the size of a carbon atom like for life. And, and atomic here will be just that the size be, uh, beyond which you cannot go. It's the piece that is um, it is not further breakable into smaller pieces. So it can be even a large segment of the system. How large each of those atomic segments is in the context of an existing app depends for the most part of the tightly the level of tight coupling within the components. It depends on uh, the languages being used, the, the, the programming patterns being used. But once you have identified in a legacy app a number of atomic segments, and the number is not usually very large, for each of them, you think what to do. You can rewrite from scratch any of those with or without UI, it depends. And once you have those atomic segments independently deployed, you can deploy them, the edge on the screen now, under a single red square representing the deployable unit. So you have a sort of a monolith made by modules, a modular monolith, or each of those atomic segments can be its own uh, app service, in which case you move towards a distributed architecture, uh, which is a, a, a term, an expression that personally uh, I like much more than the popular microservices uh, uh, expression. And here is a uh, a possible general architecture for an enterprise application that uh, comes up from an existing uh, code base that is, for the most part, obsolete and outdated, so that it dates back to uh, 10, 15 uh, years ago. There is uh, the front end. Uh, this front end can be also something completely new. Why not? can be something totally new, written with some fancy framework. Why not WiseJ at that point, just the front end? And then the, the, the front end exists to give uh, an interface to users and to permit users to perform their actions. So the next point is connecting action, call to actions you see through the UI to actual pieces of code that do the, that do the job. And then depending on the atomic segments you have called components here, you may need to have a gateway, a GraphQL gateway, or you, you can have just direct calls over there. And uh, multiple for each of those components, uh, if you go with the microservices uh, uh, patterns, uh, each of them can have uh, its own database, in which case you need synchronization between all of them, and you move towards a significantly complex uh, uh, application. Another option is uh, if you completely rewrite from scratch the existing enter an enterprise application. In this case, the best I can recommend is uh, a layered architecture that again brings up to creating, uh, uh, decomposing the number of logical functions in components in modules and then decide how these modules should be deployed, whether within a single container, a modular monolith, or independently in, in, in the context of a distributed application. Uh, the vision, the pattern behind this, uh, uh, this screen uh, 
is related, tightly related to the methodology of domain-driven design in which you have a front end that represents the user interface, which connects only to an application layer, which is where you orchestrate the various uh, tens, hundreds of them uh, workflows for each uh, action that can be uh, ordered uh, by the user. And then you see just one arrow going from the front end to the application layer. The front end knows nothing more than the application layer front end. The front end knows the infrastructure and or the persistence layer for data uh, operations and or for external services like email, PDFs, authentication and things like that. The business logic is in a domain model and then a bunch of other satellite uh, uh, assemblies for resources, for uh, uh, configuration and for uh, shared utilities uh, appear. This is the you know high level vision of a new architecture for an application. Now, how would you build concretely using which technologies those uh, uh, applications for uh, for the enterprise the first option is uh, what uh, postmodern uh, teams are doing these days uh, there is uh, essentially a javascript or typescript based uh, front end the idea that the application is a single page application uh the physical uh, implementation of the views uh, uh, is based on JavaScript code hitting uh, a sort of a virtual DOM for performance uh, reasons. And uh, this approach is uh, the favorite of uh, a new generation of front-end developers because it's cool, because it's, uh, it's, uh, it's trendy. And still is uh, an excellent option for uh, 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 those situations in which you as an organization have reasons uh, to have the front end, to see the front end as a standalone, physically separated application. There is another option that I like to call more pragmatic. Uh, and this is the option that in our company uh, we, we use uh, uh, in Sportec. So we have uh, everything based on the ASP.NET Core stack for the backend and for the front end. So it's a uh, part of our backend that is responsible for generating uh, uh, the, 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 the HTML, including the amount of JavaScript needed to make uh, animations and interactions uh, smooth and, uh, and user friendly. Uh, to do that, you can rely on uh, Razor and the ASP.NET Classic uh, um, framework for uh, language for uh, build the user interface or Blazor. Blazor is the, the new guy in, the, in, in town for UI. It's good for single page applications, but also for classic multi page uh, applications. What Blazor does is uh, it uh, issues uh, to, towards the browser a uh, web assembly with c sharp compiled code and then uh, there is uh, an open uh, uh, web socket connection through which uh, data from the client is sent to the server and vice versa and uh, uh, what, what travels towards the browser is just uh, the description of the information that with instructions on how to update the DOM to render the new state of the application. Uh, this uh, approach for building an enterprise uh, application is recommended, in my humble opinion, when uh, you have a team that uh, is uh, coming with uh, a significant skill set in uh, with ASP.NET and the MVC. Uh, paradigm and when having a monolith is acceptable. By the way, with Blazor, you can have also the approach of single page application. So you can have a Blazor app that is a standalone front end, but you also have, in addition to that, a more powerful approach that is a second option, actually, that is represented by a server and, 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 and client combined server side based rendering of the application. So Option number one, cool and trendy, 
you can only have front end and back end neatly separated. Pragmatic approach based on ASP.NET and Blazor allows you to have both the scenario in which back end and front end are distinct and the scenario in which you have a single server based application. And then there is a, yet another approach that I like to call enterprise uh, because uh, it comes uh, at probably a cost. Okay. Um, whether Angular and Blazor are essentially free of charge, at least in terms of license, uh, but you have uh, you have something more uh, uh, more mo more powerful, and uh, the amount of work you have, the amount of uh, plumbing work you need to do on your end is significantly diminished. This is, of course, the case for uh, WiseJ. and WiseJ has uh, the best takes the best of the other two scenarios. So it can be used for uh, building SPAs from scratch. It can be used uh, for uh, creating server-side based applications. And more than everything else, it, it is also designed from the grounds up to give you a fantastic shortcut to bringing existing. And when I say existing, I just mean existing as is applications to a new life because uh, the programming model you experience towards WasteJ is uh, mimicking the, let's say that, fantastic programming model made popular by web forms and Windows forms uh, 20 years ago, the moment when we started the, this uh, journey uh, through the, the past 20 years of development, web development. And it means that simply detaching, okay, cutting off the visual part and putting a new modern visual, you can, at an acceptable cost for the enterprise standards, you can connect a new interface towards nearly the same existing business logic. And uh, this is the, the magic, essentially, that... Uh, you can achieve when you need to go fast because uh, the, 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 the faster you go, the more money you save or gain and also allows to reuse the skills and business logic. So when we hear, and that was exactly the case of the previous talk, uh, that uh, a fairly complex ERP-based application has been rewritten by five people in seven months, well, that's a fantastic result that no way you have any chance to achieve with any other option out there. It's enterprisey just because it's enterprise. Any questions? That's it for me. <laughs> <laughs> um Thank you very much, Dino. Um, yeah, I think we have one um, uh, one um, guy here that raised the hand. Um, I just want to reach out to Nicholas uh, Mokri. Um, do you have a question for Dino? Yep. You should be able to... to I'm do... not sure I'm hearing. Let me see if I can see yeah, this I... uh, into mm. the... Just saw the raising hand, and um, but I'm I'm also not hearing him. Um, so he's, he's he's muted. You may have to unmute him. Yes, uh, let me check. Um, now he should be able. So Nicholas, if you want to raise a question, then uh, please uh, press the unmute button. I I can't do this uh, from here, uh, but uh, just uh, just raise raise your hand or just uh, raise your voice if you want to. Okay, I'm, I'm I'm not hearing anything, but um, then I would I would just like like to say thank you, um, Dino, for for taking us uh, uh, with you on the journey of uh, looking back a little bit, talking yeah. about today, but also the outlook. Uh, I really appreciate having you here today and tonight uh, for this uh, special day and event uh, with us. Um, and um, I think it's a it's a great summary of uh, where we position Wise Day and uh, where we actually see the strength and also our further further outlook and also the further path um, looking forward um, of YJ. Um, there's a lot on our roadmap um, that we are going to update um, and, and work on in the next uh, months and in the next couple of years. 
And um, your words are encouraging um, just to continue this journey. And uh, I think uh, the case that we saw with Abtec and many others that are with us today um, in Italy, in, 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 in Europe, in, in the US, all over the world, um, it's uh, it's very promising. And I think there's a, it's a good spot and a good space and place also for Wiseshade to be in this scenario, especially when it gets complex and when you have, have to get your work done. Um, and that's uh, for us a, a key element. So I, think, um, yeah. I think it's also a matter of age. Uh, because uh, uh, looking back is the thing I do best these days because of the gray hair that uh, <laughs> I see. You know, mine are grayer than yours. <laughs> so looking back is the thing I do best. But looking back, you 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 probably see uh, the patterns that are in a way you now determining the directions of today and because of the age and because of the of the forces that tend to slow down a little bit, uh, uh, we to have things done, we want to use and pick up just the right tool for the job, not to waste any energy. And it's, I think it's especially true uh, when you look at the today's scape, uh, where we um, see um, ju just um, a, a lack of, of, of workforce, uh, a, la a lack of developers around. Um, I think the, the pressure on productivity has grown a lot, uh, especially in the last two, three years. Um, I know that it's uh, difficult in Italy, it's difficult in Germany and other European countries in the US. I can't speak for the entire world, but I hear it a lot from customers uh, that they're really under pressure. Uh, they have to you know, innovate, they have to bring out new features, they have to be highly productive on their tools, on, the, on, on their software. And at the same time, um, going the uh, the, 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 the JavaScript way uh, of developing single page applications is is nothing that's going to happen fast, especially if you have to solve a task like the one that Amit shared with us. Um, and therefore, it's uh, it's a matter of age um, uh, between us guys, uh, definitely, but also a productivity pressure that I see with with many organizations um, as they're moving forward with digitalization and bringing bringing new software, new applications out to the customers. Yeah. But there is another. If you, if I could just a couple more minutes, uh, there's okay. another point uh, that I would like to uh, to emphasize here. So uh, I've been seeing uh, since the early 2000s, so 20 years ago, a number of companies uh, uh, growing up significantly and make their own money and, and grow big uh, by selling components. You know, there is no need, uh, like uh, to to make uh, explicit names, but you know what, what I mean. So there are so many now that they are, they are just three or four, uh, particularly big, but they were f quite a few of them in the past. But uh, at the very end of the day, my experience, and not just my personal experience, but also the experience of the customers I had the chance to work with uh, in, in these years, uh, is that in a way or the other. There is a, a, a inevitable the vendor lock-in because you get there, uh, you get stuck into those beautiful, fantastic, super exciting components, and uh, those components are great for the number of scenarios that have been, no, that the team has focused on, but making changes there is a quite a bit problematic, not to mention the burden it is uh, across uh, multiple and uh, newer and older versions. Uh, my impression, okay, for the for what I've seen so far is that YSJ is, is, is different in this part because using YSJ is more similar to using a well-done blazer. So uh, a, a framework that allows at the lower level to do things, but it's a uh, it, it, the, the lower level, I mean, in the sense that it doesn't create lock-in, so it gives you a, a box full of features. It gives you pieces through which you can build your own box. Still, you you have a you you have you you remain as a company linked to a vendor. That, that that's of course that that's for sure. It's inevitable, but the the level of lock-in is much less significant than in other scenarios that in the past. At least the past decade that we we've we've seen. When I speak to uh, 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 companies, to representatives of these companies, it's amazing what you hear. What, what is the message? The most of their revenues are still coming from the versions of the components for web forms. Absolutely. Yeah. Okay. So, and web forms is now 
2004, 5, 6. So mm -hmm. it's, uh, well, 15 years ago. Mm -hmm. So even though the technology has dramatically evolved in 15 years, uh, but uh, the, the, the people with the money, the, the big number of enterprises are still doing business the old way. So it's time for a new old way that, lo that, 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 that lasts for uh, another number of decades uh, uh, while providing the same effectiveness uh, as the original ASP.NET Web Forms model. Absolutely, yes. And um, we are looking forward to um, to being around for um, a few more decades. Uh, before you joined, um, I, I, I shared some old pictures um, because we, we turned 25 uh, this year. Uh, so it's uh, okay. 25 anniversaries. We have at least another 25 years to go. Um, so we are very, very happy uh, together Not with too you bad. and uh, all of you joining today uh, to look to the future. And um, there's there's a lot uh, to be achieved and to, to be continued. And one key aspect of YJ that you just mentioned uh, will remain a core value, uh, being an open platform and being able to extend and not to lock in, but providing a technology basis for which you can add new stuff, additional components, specialized uh, requirements, such as the one that we saw with Amtech, where you had the scheduling view, a gunshot that we would never be able to to provide ourselves as a company, as a component. Uh, but I think it's it's good to have choice and you know to let applications evolve and include uh, what's needed for the business requirements. Um, so thank you once again, Dino, uh, for being with us tonight. Uh, I really appreciate that. Um, and um, we've we've almost come um, to an end. Um, I've 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 just um, uh, a couple. Of, um, um, of, of last things to share with you. Um, first of all, um, it's um, uh, the the end of this year and um, also the beginning of next year um, with a few announcements because we'll be around um, at a number of events. Uh, by the way, you have a good chance to meet Dino. I think uh, Dino, we'll go to see each other in Frankfurt uh, at Basta yep. in February next year. Um, um, and uh, we would like to invite you um, uh, to come there as well if you want to. Um, uh, before that, we will be in uh, Frankfurt uh, in December already. I will um, hold a session on desktop to web with wise.net at the IT target. Uh, that's in December in just a couple of weeks. Um, end of January, beginning of February, we'll be in London, United Kingdom, as a sponsor of the NDC event. Um, but uh, if you have a chance to uh, to come to, to Frankfurt, for example, if you're located in Europe, uh, also maybe come up from Italy, from Switzerland, from France, um, a special invite because there will be something new at Basta next year. Um, we've been sponsoring the event for a number of years, but uh, this year, or actually next year, we are going to run a full day workshop uh, on YShare.net. This will be held by Luca and Levi. And uh, it's like a like a white share masterclass um, um, that's being done on Monday. So it's the, the first day of, of the Buster event. And if you're interested in, in meeting us, in meeting the team and learning something, it will be an eight hour um, um, full day um, a workshop event. Then uh, just drop me a line because I have uh, a, a nice discount um, on these tickets that are being sold uh, through the company that runs Buster. Um, I think it's a great chance, and uh, we would be happy and glad to 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 have a beer or uh, some some tea or whatever you'd like to have in the evening with you. Uh, it's it's a good chance for a personal meeting and also for maybe learning something about the new stuff um, in more depth than what we were able to show today. Um, that's uh, yeah, an invite to come and join us. Um, some more feedback. Um, we are working on a new platform that's going to be released soon. We wanted to have it in place. Uh, for the 3.5 release, but didn't make it in time. And then we concentrated on features as developers as we are. It will be uh, learnyj.com. It's a new platform with articles, reviews, tutorials on yj.net. Dino has already contributed a little bit to it. Um, we are also working with um, other external authors like John Hilton, um, an expert that also works a lot with Blazor. And um, he's comparing Blazor and yj in different aspects. Um, and we are we are continuing to add um, text, so this will be released very soon. And another announcement uh, for the new year, um, um, something um, that we that we want to do next year is to actually do um, webinars. Our plan is to hold them monthly, um, so that we invite you maybe um, at this point of the day to cover as many time zones as possible throughout the world. We will also be. Uh, recording these webinars. So it's a great um, opportunity to maybe look into a certain topic, a certain aspect of YSJ. 
And um, we would um, love to hear back from you. What are your favorite topics? What would you like us to cover in such a webinar? Uh, when you leave uh, this event here, uh, you're going to see a small questionnaire. Um, and we listed a couple of topics that may be interesting for you. But uh, there's also a comment field in this questionnaire. So feel free to also suggest um, some additional stuff or just drop me a line. I would love to hear back from you and uh, take these topics um, with um, with me to my team uh, to discuss uh, what we can cover in, in the next few months. So to wrap it up, um, once again, a big thank you. Um, it would be cool if you could uh, also share your feedback about the event with us. Um, and uh, if, did you like it? Is there something to improve for us? It was the very first time. So we're all a bit nervous if everything works out. Um, I'm still on my way to becoming a Zoom expert. Um, it's, it's, a, it's a long way to go. It's a very complex system. Um, but uh, thanks for thank you all for listening, uh, for staying up or uh, getting up early uh, to be part of this event. We really appreciate um, working with you, having you with us today. Um, so take care. Um, all the best. A Merry Christmas. Uh, I think I can share, start to share this already. Tomorrow is the 1st of December. Um, and uh, yeah, don't hesitate to just drop us some feedback by email or by leaving a comment in the questionnaire. Thank you. Thank you for all the speakers, to Dino, to Amit, Thank to you. my colleagues, Levi and Luca. Take care and uh, hope to see you soon again online or elsewhere. Thank you.